In chapter 4, it speaks about memorials. It speaks about remembering. It speaks about setting up something to bring about memory of what God had done for them in this place and in this time. And that that memory should be lingering, that it ought to be in the minds of the children, it ought to be in the descendants, there ought to be something about it that they always uh, recognize what it is that God did. It was all about God. It was all about the circumstances that dealt with uh, in speaking about what God had done for them in this circumstance and situation. Memorials are important. And that is, and, uh, and of course we have that one memorial that we uh, talked about just a few minutes ago. We have a memorial where we remember what Christ did through an activity that we as a church do. We remember it by, as we partake of the bread, and the fruit of the vine. We remember it as we remember the broken body that was that nail was nail pierced. We remember it as we recognize through that fruit of the vine the blood that was shed for us. And so it's important to remember. It's important to do that. Now, as they are going through these things, there were uh, uh, we recognize that one of the things that had taken place here as all of those in the nation, while they had their their gates shut and they had everything that, and they realized that they had been spies that had come in and looked around and they knew about those things, but they weren't too bad worried because Jordan was overflowed and the water was there and it was a mile wide and that, that group of people was on the other side. Now they knew they were coming, but they didn't know when they'd be there. But then they recognized, because it was close to Jericho, they recognized that the water had stopped and that they had walked over on dry ground. And so it tells us in the first verse of this chapter, it says, And it came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of Jordan westward, and all the king of the Can kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel until they were passed over, that their heart melted. Neither was their spirit in them anymore because of the children of Israel. They saw what God did and it scared the daylights out of them. They knew that this was real. They knew that the one that Israel had with them was really God. And they recognized something about that. Now, you know, there is a couple of things that we can do based on learning that particular thing. We can either then begin to trust God ourselves, or we can battle against Him. We can either let him become a part of our life or we can push him off to the side and say, I don't want anything to do with him. We can say, I want to trust him or we can say, I don't want anything to do with him and I'm going to try my best to get away from him. The reality is that the majority of them, while their heart melted from this, they were not willing to trust this God of Israel to be their God. They were not ready to make any commitment to Him. Hearing the message is one thing. Knowing it to be true is one thing. But the reality is you either take it and make it a part of your life or you cast it aside. There are choices to be made in any circumstance or situation. There are things that we may, must determine about it. Of course they thought, you know, they couldn't get them yet, but now they were so uncertain about it. So God moved His people across on dry 
dry ground. But now we need to understand something about this. You see, back when they were in Egypt, back when the children of Israel came out at the Passover, back when the Red Sea was opened up, back when they went through all the things they did in preparation for leaving, God had made a covenant with Israel. And they had made a decision saying they were going to follow the Lord and they were going to follow Him fully. And so they went to the mountain and they got the law and they got the, the commandments and they, and they saw how God dealt with them with the, the food that they were given every day and how that they, He provided water for them right out of a rock and how He did uh, provided the meat for them as the quails came flying into camp and all those things that were a part of that but they came to the edge of Canaan where God had said this land is your land and you can take it and they decided that they weren't able it had nothing to do with their abilities because when God gives a task, He gives the strength to do it. He gives everything that's necessary. He follows through in every kind of way. He keeps every promise He makes. But they, on the other hand, decided that the giants in the land were stronger and more capable, and they wouldn't go in. They didn't trust. Now, all of these things that took place in Egypt were to bring the people to the place where they were God's people, where they were children of God, where they were leaving behind the things that had held them in Egypt, where they were leaving behind the world that they had known, where they were leaving behind the struggles and the slavery and everything that was a part of that. And we come to this place, and through the journey, because they had refused, God said, you're not going in. And so every male capable of war, above 20 years old and upward, died in the wilderness, except Joshua and Caleb who had said, we are strong enough to do it. We can go in because God is on our side. And so, he come to this place, and God says, after going over the water, God says, I'm going to renew, I want you to renew the covenant that we have. We have a covenant that says, we get rid of the filthiness of the flesh. We get rid of the things of, of the past. We get rid of the slavery and the bondage and everything that you had. And we, and you are a people in obedience to me. And so he gave a task for them to do. And he said, this is what's got to take place and happen. We need to remove, we need to renew the covenant. The picture of all of this is the removal of sin. The picture of all of this is casting aside the old man. The picture of all of this is to become new in him. The picture that we see in everything about this particular uh, part of the chapter has to do with being spiritually prepared for spiritual activity, for being ready to do what God told them to do, for being, for being obedient. Now, oftentimes, when that situation develops and it comes up, we see the difficulty. We see the problems. We see the things that we can't do. And we, and we look at that rather than looking at the God who can. And we look at the man who can't. And we see it more clearly. And so, uh, looking at the difficulty keeps us from looking at God seeing what God can do. God had just done all of this and so when they came across and they settled down there, they did exactly what God told them to do. Now, you know, we look back at a picture several years before. 
when there was a nation and a country that uh, wanted to be a part of with them, with Jacob's children. And the prince of the, of the country had mistreated Jacob's daughter. He had, he had actually he had raped her. And it angered the sons of Jacob to the point. But they said, they told the king, he said, you know, because of the circumstances, he said, if you do what we have done and you be a part of this covenant, you circumcise all your males, then we'll, we'll do this. So they did that, and then while things were difficult for them because they couldn't get up and do anything, they just had surgery, they went in and killed everybody. They got rid of the males. Well, here they are in the same situation. They've crossed over Jordan. They're already on the side where all the kings and all the people are. And God says, this is what I want you to do. And they did. And they were vulnerable at that point. Well, oftentimes as Christians, we look at the things of the world. And we look at the, uh, the things that they say and the things that they do. And, and, and we find ourselves on the defensive all the time. One thing I remember very well and about something that uh, Ken Ham said about 20 years ago. He said, he was talking about the way that we tend to battle with people on things that are doctrinally incorrect. They, saw, they talk about evolution as though it's a fact and won't commit themselves to the belief that God created and all of the things that are a part of that. And oftentimes, when the discussion comes up about creation versus evolution, uh, the, often the idea then is, uh, well, you can talk to me about it, but don't use the Bible. And he said, well, that's crazy. Uh, Ken Ham says, uh, we can use the Bible because the Bible is the truth. And he said, they want us to throw away all that we have that, that, is, uh, that is the truth and try to do things according to what they say in their books, and that don't work. You know, we, we battle against the, the world that is opposed to the things that we say. And we, and constantly uh, in that, uh, we tend to uh, yield to the world rather than recognizing God in the midst of it. Bible is the truth. The work from beginning to end is the truth. We can stand upon it. We can, uh, and in every sense of the word, if anything is opposed to that word, if it is uh, uh, against it, if it contradicts it, then the contradiction is what's false. I've said that over and over again, and I'll continue to say that because the word of God is truth. Now, here in this circumstances, God had already done two things for them in this situation. One, he had opened up the waters and let them walk through. And two, he had, because of that, uh, caused the enemy, all of those, to be fearful, to be afraid. To, their hearts were melted. It was, uh, their circumstances were that they saw that this God could do what he what he uh, need, needed to and claimed to do in every kind of way. This thing that we're looking at in these verses of Scripture deals with being spiritually prepared to do whatever it is that we need to do. As Christians, prayer and Bible study, those things need to precede, precede anything that we try to do for God. We need to be with, you know, the Bible makes it plain. This brother James and I was talking about this morning when it says, study to show thyself a proof. We need to know the Word of God in order to be able to, to move forward with these things. This thing they did, they did two things in this instance. They renewed their commitment to the Lord, casting away the things of the past, the sin filthiness of the flesh and they 
observed Passover before going in. They were spiritually prepared to do what God gave them to do. And God said to them that he, would re that he was rolling away the reproach. You know, we, we often, um, with our past, we know we've sinned. We know we've done wrong. We know that, uh, we know that God, uh, that what God says about that sin, and we know that he pushed it as far as the east is from the west, that he doesn't remember it anymore against us. And yet we continue to bring it up. We continue to remember it. We continue to let it prevent us from being able to do what God wants us to do. We tend to see ourselves as less than. But when Christ comes in, you're more than. You're greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. When you, uh, you know, we're talking about the end of the old life and new life and new direction and growth and faith and maturity and all those things. But we need that time with God. Now, one of the things that somebody said about these verses, said, he said, uh, and Tom about it, he said, I, I have difficulty with, uh, with uh, waiting. He said, I have difficulty with letting the time, uh, with struggling with the delays. I have difficulty with, uh, with God uh, seemingly uh, waiting before he does something uh, with the delays uh, but uh, then he said but I know that the delays of God are better than my haste than my trying to do my trying to get it done quicker than, than any of those things that we're always anxious to do something for God but we forget that the first thing he wants is for us to, to be something for him that we need to be uh, Christians. Now, uh, there's a, uh, a man named uh, uh, Doug Goins that said there's four things that uh, that we need to recognize as Christians. He said, first of all, that when God expresses himself through his people, the world takes notice. When something good happens, when God begins to move, those around will pay attention. He said, secondly, he said, spiritual preparation must precede any activity. That your heart has to be right if you're going to do anything with God. That you're, you have to be ready through Him if you're going to do anything for Him. Then, Thirdly, he said, you must be willing to recognize that God doesn't always do things in exactly the same way. You know, we, uh, we know what he did with Paul. He put a big bright light down on him. And Paul had to stop. And, and, and he, he couldn't make, keep going in the direction he was going. God doesn't always shine a big bright light down on in that kind of way. We know that there were places where the angel of the Lord appeared to people, but he doesn't always appear to people today. We know that uh, there are differences in the way that people are convicted and convinced. And sometimes uh, it's one way and sometimes it's another. We know that, uh, that uh, uh, you know, because something works in one church doesn't mean it works in another. That God does things different with different with different churches and different people. And, but we need to be uh, recognized. And here He changes things. Uh, after they did, ate the Passover, uh, there wasn't any more man on the ground. They had to eat of the good of the land. And they had to believe that God was going to continue to provide for them, even though He wasn't giving them manna every morning. You know, God will continue to provide the way that, with whatever need it is that we have. And then we need to make sure that we are led of God. The last part of this chapter is very, very interesting. 
Joshua comes out and he looks over and he sees a man standing over there with a sword drawn in his hand. Real neat situation. So he, he being the man of war that he is, being the commander that he is, being the leader that he is, he goes over and confronts the guy. And he says, he says, uh, verse 13, when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversary? Are you for us or are you for them? And the man said, No. He didn't say, No, I'm not for them. He said, No. I'm not for you or for them. I'm the one that's in charge here. I, as the captain of the Lord's host, am I come. He said, and Joshua recognized that he was in the presence of something totally different. He said, here's what he said. He said, nay, but as the captain of the host of the Lord, am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship. You know, worship angels. He worshiped, and this is by all counts and purposes a free uh, uh, a point where God appeared in the flesh before he came as a man. This is, we're looking probably at the Son of God in a, um, in a pre-incarnation appearance. And he says to him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose the feet from off the shoe from off thy foot, for the place where he on thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Now, let me just make a statement about this particular thing. He came, and obviously, he told him the manner in which he was to fight the next battle. And we know what the next battle is. The next battle is Jericho. Now, anybody that looks at that situation, they're going to think it's downright crazy. Marching around the city, going down every day for seven days, and he's going to say, okay, walk around seven times, thinking anything's going to happen. God told him what he wanted to do. What Joshua was, was obedient. And that's, that's the key to every bit of this that's in this chapter. The obedience of those that crossed over the water. The obedience of those that put their feet down in that water so that, so that, so that they would they'd be able to go over on dry land. The obedience of them going over on dry land and stopping and circumcising all the males because they hadn't been circumcised on the way over. The obedience of those as they observed the Passover feast, the obedience of those that committed themselves to the Lord to be prepared to do what God wanted them to do. The obedience of Joshua as he listened to God as he spoke to him about what needed to take place as they come to, to face the battle that was going to take place following all of this. You see, what God wants from us is to hear what it is, to know what he is saying, to be obedient to him, to live for him. We are his children through faith in Jesus Christ. We need to follow him according to his word. We need to go beyond uh, I'm not, you know, there's one thing that saves us from there all along, and that's trusting Jesus as Savior. But once we're a Christian, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity, the Bible says. The Bible teaches us that we need to be followers and not hearers only of the Word. We need to do what the Bible says. We need to serve Him. 
Father, as we come to you in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for these words, and Lord, we pray that you guide us and direct us and help us to be as those children of Israel were, as they crossed over believing, as they renewed their covenant believing, as they listened to your word believing, and doing what it is that you told them to do. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be followers and not just hearers. In Jesus' name, amen.